Hi everybody, this is Shannon from No Shelf Control. I am here tonight to tell you about 11 books that I took from my library book sale as a book haul. And I am super excited about all of them. I don't know why the library is getting rid of all these books, but I am definitely acquiring them. And I wanted you to know about all the titles I picked up. So they are all backlist, but they are all super exciting, amazing titles um, that you've probably heard of, but may not know much about. Um, so I hope you will stick around and listen to the list of books that I picked up. Why don't we go ahead and get started? The first one on my list is called Last Ride to Graceland. And I got this one in paperback, so it cost me a dollar. Um, and it is Last Ride to Graceland by Kim Wright. The blurb on the front of the book says, an engrossing road trip of self-discovery. Mary Alice Monroe, author of A Low Country Wedding. And you know I love a good road trip. So this was definitely one I had to pick up. I love the sort of old style motel sign. It says groceries underneath. And it's got the big arrow and then the beautiful pink and purple sky. So this one caught my attention. I had to grab it. Let's see what we know about it. Uh, it was published May 24th, 2016 by Gallery Books, and it's 352 pages. Here's the synopsis. One woman sets out for Graceland, hoping to answer the question, is Elvis Presley her father? Blues musician Corey Ainsworth is barely scraping by after her mother's death when she discovers a priceless piece of rock and roll memorabilia hidden away in a shed out back of the family's coastal South Carolina home. Elvis Presley's Stutz Blackhawk, its interior a time capsule of the singer's last day on earth. A backup singer for the king, Corey's mother Honey, was at Graceland the day Elvis died. She quickly returned home to Beaufort and married her high school sweetheart. Yearning to uncover the secrets of her mother's past and possibly her own identity, Corey decides to drive the car back to Memphis and turn it over to Elvis's estate, retracing the exact route her mother took 37 years earlier. As she winds her way through the sprawling deep south with its quaint towns and long stretches of open road, the burning question in Corey's mind, who is my father, takes a back seat to the truth she learns about her complicated mother, the minister's daughter who spent a lifetime struggling to conceal the consequences of a single year of rebellion. So I think that sounds great. You know, the whole road trip thing I love, the deep south I love, the whole idea that this revolves around Elvis Presley, you know, Elvis is a little before my time, but still, you know, he's an icon. And the idea that she thinks he might be her father and has found a piece of memorabilia that belongs to him. Um, I just think the whole thing sounds like a lot of fun. So I picked it up because of the cover and because it referenced a road trip, um, but definitely purchased it because um, the synopsis just sounded like a ball. So I hope you might enjoy that one too. That is Last Ride to Graceland by Kim Wright. The next one on my list, I'm sure you've heard of. It is called Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan. And I got this one for a dollar as well. And it is a nice quality, like good quality paperback. Um, it says there's rich, there's filthy rich, and then there's crazy rich. A Pride and Prejudice-like send up. People Magazine. So that's the blurb on the front of Crazy Rich Asians. She's got, you know, she's beautiful with these big glasses and then the, the necklace and the earrings on the cover actually sparkle. I think you can kind of see that. So it's a really cool cover. Let me tell you more about what I know about this one. So this one was published June 11th, 2013. So again, backlist, all backlist um, by Doubleday and it's 403 pages. It is set in Singapore, New York City, Hong Kong, Shanghai, London, Shenzhen, Macau, Indonesia, China, England, and Southeast Asia, according to Goodreads. Um, and the characters are Rachel Chu and Nicholas Young. So let's see what the synopsis has to say. Crazy Rich Asians is the outrageously funny debut novel about three super rich pedigreed Chinese families and the gossip, backbiting, and scheming that occurs when the heir to one of the most massive fortunes in Asia brings home his ABC, American-born Chinese, girlfriend to the wedding of the season. When Rachel Chu agrees to spend the summer in Singapore with her boyfriend, Nicholas Young, she envisions a humble family home, long drives to explore the island, and quality time with the man she might one day marry. 
What she doesn't know is that Nick's family home happens to look like a palace, that she'll ride in more private planes than cars, and that with one of Asia's most eligible bachelors on her arm, Rachel might as well have a target on her back. Initiated into a world of dynastic splendor beyond imagination, Rachel meets Astrid, the it girl of Singapore society. Eddie, whose family practically lives in the pages of the Hong Kong socialite magazines. And Eleanor, Nick's formidable mother, a woman who has very strong feelings about who her son should and should not marry. Uproarious, addictive, and filled with jaw-dropping opulence, Crazy Rich Asians is an insider's look at the Asian jet set, a perfect depiction of the class between old money and new money, between overseas Chinese and mainland Chinese, and a fabulous novel about what it means to be young, in love, and gloriously, crazily rich. So how can you resist that? You know, the whole look behind the scenes of like the ridiculously wealthy, um, something I'm never going to see in my lifetime, but something that, you know, I love to read about in a story, um, you know, that appeals, of course. Also, the idea that um, we have American-born Chinese and mainland-born uh, Chinese, I think it'll be interesting to see the difference between those two types of people. Um, and then that this is Kevin Kwan's debut also appeals to me. So, and that it's uh, compared as a pride and prejudice like send up. I wonder, you know, what People Magazine means by that and how that's going to come into play here. So, um, really interested in Asia, um, having lived there. And also just really interested in this degree of opulence. You know, it's it's ridiculous, but I've got to see it. So um, I had started reading this at one point. I don't know what, I, I get distracted easily and run off to the next thing. Um, so I don't know why I didn't finish it, but I probably only completed about a chapter of it. So I'm really interested now that I have it in my hot little hands to finish it. So um, I hope you might be interested in that one as well. That's Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan. The third one I have on my list is by someone very popular. It's Kate Atkinson, and the book is called Case Histories. Uh, the blurb says, grabs hold of the reader and doesn't let go. Case Histories winds up having more depth and vividness than ordinary thrillers and more thrills than ordinary fiction. That sounds perfect to me. I love a thriller, but I like it to be, you know, more sort of substantive fiction. So a, you know, substantive fiction book with a thrill in it, I would love that. So that's why I picked this one up, Case Histories by Kate Atkinson. The, um, oh, and I should show you the cover. So the cover down at the bottom, you can see just barely, is looking out over the windshield of a car with a hand driving the steering wheel. So, you know, maybe, just maybe another road trip novel. So we will see. This one was published October 17th, 2005, so so far the oldest of the books that we've looked at, by Back Bay Books, and it's 389 pages. This is the first book in the Jackson Brody series. So Kate Atkinson wrote a series of thrillers with a lead character called Jackson Brody, and this is the first one. And I have read none of them, so I'm very excited. Uh, it's set in Cambridge, England, and it won the Orange Prize, or it was on the Orange Prize for Fiction long list the Saltier Society Literary Award for Scottish Book of the Year in 2005. So let's see what the synopsis says about this one. It's a very short synopsis. It says, in number one of the series, Jackson Brody P.I. follows three 30 years cold, unconnected Cambridge family cases. One, a little girl disappears in the night. Two, a beautiful young office worker falls to a maniac's attack. And three, a new mother is overwhelmed by demands from her baby and husband until a fit of rage creates a grisly, bloody escape. Result, startling connections and discoveries emerge. So they tell us very little about what's going to happen in this book, which I'm okay with. Um, but it sounds like three very compelling stories about three potential cases uh, that Jackson Brody is going to try to solve. So... I am interested in this one by far, um, and we shall see what happens. Number four on the list, another very popular, very famous book that I have not read and was excited to get my hands on, is The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. Uh, this is winner of the Pulitzer Prize. It says, an American masterpiece from NPR. Barack Obama called it terrific. 
Uh, the New York Times book review called it stunningly daring and the Washington Post called it a triumph. So, and I like how they've depicted the Underground Railroad here. You can see railroad tracks and little people running along it. So I think this is a very inventive little cover. Let's talk about this one. So The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead published August 2nd, 2016 by Doubleday and it's 306 pages. Uh, it is set in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Indiana. And the characters are Caesar, Cora Randall, Mabel Randall, Arnold Ridgway, and Martin Wells. And this won the Pulitzer, as I said, the National Book Award for Fiction, and was on the Booker Prize long list uh, in 2017. Here is the synopsis of this one. Cora is a slave on a cotton plantation in Georgia. Life is hell for all the slaves, but especially bad for Cora, an outcast even among her fellow Africans. She is coming into womanhood, where even greater pain awaits. When Caesar, a recent arri arrival from Virginia, tells her about the Underground Railroad, they decide to take a terrifying risk and escape. Matters do not go as planned. Cora kills a young white boy who tries to capture her. Though they manage to find a station and head north, they are being hunted. In Whitehead's ingenious conception, the Underground Railroad is no mere metaphor. Engineers and conductors operate a secret network of tracks and tunnels beneath the southern soil. Cora and Caesar's first stop is South Carolina, in a city that initially seems like a haven, but the city's placid surface masks an insidious scheme designed for its black denizens. And even worse, Ridgeway, the relentless slave catcher, is close on their heels. Forced to flee again, Cora embarks on a harrowing flight, state by state, seeking true freedom. Like the protagonist of Gulliver's Travels, Cora encounters different worlds at each stage of her journey. Hers is an odyssey through time as well as space. As Whitehead brilliantly recreates the unique terrors for Black people in the pre-Civil War era, his narrative seamlessly weaves the saga of America from the brutal importation of Africans to the unfulfilled promises of the present day. The Underground Railroad is at once a kinetic adventure tale of one woman's ferocious will to escape the horrors of bondage and a shattering, powerful meditation on the history we all share. That just sounds incredible. I mean, it just sounds so good to me. Um, you know, the, the idea that the Underground Railroad is really a railroad in this book um, and that these two people are trying to flee a plantation. They've killed a white boy and now they are on the run and going to you know, hit all of these different places and have stories in each of these different locations with different people. I just love that. So even better, I think, than a road trip story. Um, so we will see, but this, you know, everybody sings the praises of this book. So I was thrilled to get my hands on it and surprised at how small it is. Um, so I bet I can get through this one rather quickly, but, but we'll see. So excited about the Underground Railroad. I hope you will check it out. The next one on my list is called Everything Here is Beautiful by Mira T. Lee. Uh, and the blurb says, a tender but unflinching portrayal of the bond between two sisters. And that quote is from Celeste Ng, whom I love. And uh, this one is a large print copy, so it looks bigger than it really is. Um, I'll take whatever I can get. If I can get a large print copy for a dollar at the book sale, I'll take it, absolutely. So that's Everything Here is Beautiful. It does have two really gorgeous butterflies on the front. And considering that Celeste Ng says it's the portrayal of the bond between two sisters, I wonder if the sisters aren't represented by the two butterflies. So let's find out. This one was published January 16th, 2018. So this is the newest of the ones we've talked about so far. It is published by Pamela Dorman Books and it's 360 pages. Here's what the synopsis says. Two Chinese American sisters, Miranda, the older responsible one, always her younger sister's protector, Lucia, the headstrong, unpredictable one whose impulses are huge and often life-changing. When Lucia starts hearing voices, it is Miranda who must find a way to reach her sister. Lucia impetuously plows ahead, but the bitter constant is that she is, in fact, mentally ill. Lucia lives life on a grand scale until inevitably she crashes to earth. 
Miranda leaves her own self-contained life in Switzerland to rescue her sister again, but only Lucia can decide whether she wants to be saved. The bonds of sisterly devotion stretch across, uh, across oceans, but what does it take to break them? Everyone Here is Beautiful is, at its heart, an immigrant story and a young woman's quest to find fulfillment and a life unconstrained by her illness. But it is also an unforgettable, gut-wrenching story of the sacrifices we make to truly love someone and when loyalty to oneself must prevail over all. So again, found another book that I'm just super excited about. You've got the mental health aspect here and the idea of, you know, what lengths will you go to to help and protect someone that you love who's dealing with their own demons. You know, we we deal with that in my house. You know, the, the idea that I have some mental health issues and that my husband, you know, has to go to some lengths sometimes to help, you know, me protect myself um, is a big deal. Um, so that, as well as the relationship between the two sisters, the idea that they are Chinese American. Um, I love a good immigrant story, um, but I really am honed into the idea of the one sister trying to help the other sister and what Lucia, the sister with the mental health challenges, is going through and how that's going to play out in this book. So always very interested in how mental health issues are depicted in stories, um, sometimes really, really well. Um, sometimes you know that an author has some insight into these types of issues. And sometimes they're not depicted quite so well. And you wonder, what what do people actually think mental health challenges look like? You know, or, or you know, maybe they just look so vastly different for different people that there are times when I can't recognize them. So, but I am super excited about this one. Everything Here is Beautiful by Mira T. Lee. All right, what is up next? Oh, this is a good one. This one is actually still in its packaging. I'll show it to you. This one is Theft by Finding, Diaries 1977 to 2002 by David Sedaris. I absolutely love David Sedaris. I've seen him in person probably three or four times. I'm taking the wrapping off of this so we can get to it. I mean, this literally must have never even made it into circulation. It's brand stinking new. So um, it says national bestseller on the front. There are a couple of blurbs on the back. An observant, acidic writer. It's helpful to see that a voice as original, as hilarious, and sometimes infuriating as Sedaris's was put through the same struggle and starve meat grinder that most of us go through. And I think that's really the beauty of David Sedaris's writing. When you listen to him or, or read him, you think, yeah, I've been through that. Yeah, I know what that's like. Oh my God, he knows exactly what that feels like. Um, and I think that's why, you know, people respond to David Sedaris the way they do. Certainly why I respond to him the way I do. So um, I don't know if I've read everything he's ever written, but damn close. So um, let's read a little bit more about this one. And I guess the reason that I'm so excited about this book is because I have read damn near everything David Sedaris has written. I did another one this summer on audiobook on the way to Florida, and I can't think of the name of it, but it was his most recent one that I did on audiobook. So whenever David Sedaris releases something, um, I grab it. So I can't believe that I've actually missed this one. So this one, Theft by Finding, um, published May 30th, 2017 by Little Brown and Company, and it is 514 pages. So you can see it is a big chunker. It is also written as diary entries, um, which I kind of love. I love an alternative format, um, but it also, you know, will be a quicker read just simply because they don't always take up the whole page. The diary entries are, are split here and there. So... Uh, don't be intimidated by the size of the book. So let's read the synopsis. Here's what I've got. David Sedaris tells all in a book that is literally a lifetime in the making. For 40 years, David Sedaris has kept a diary in which he records everything that captures his attention. Overheard comments, salacious gossip, soap opera plot twists, secrets confided by total strangers. These observations are the source code for his finest work and through them, he has honed his cunning, surprising sentences. Now, Sedaris shares his private writings with the world. 
Theft by Finding, the first of two volumes, is the story of how a drug-abusing dropout with a weakness for the International House of Pancakes and a chronic inability to hold down a real job became one of the funniest people on the planet. Written with a sharp eye and ear for the bizarre, the beautiful, and the uncomfortable, and with a generosity of spirit that even a misanthropic sense of humor can't fully disguise, Theft by Finding proves that Sedaris is one of our great modern observers. It's a potent reminder that when you're as perceptive and curious as Sedaris, there's no such thing as a boring day. Yeah, I think that really is it um, about him. You get the feeling that he's a good guy, despite the misanthropic sort of exterior, the cynical exterior that he presents. Um, you really do get a sense through to his heart in his writing, um, you know, despite everything. So... I love David Sedaris. If you've never read David Sedaris, please pick up something. Um, start with uh, Dress Your Family in Corduroy and, gosh, what is it called? Hold on. Dress Your Family in Corduroy and Denim. Start with that one. Dress Your Family in uh, Corduroy and Denim or Me Talk Pretty One Day. So if you've never read David Sedaris, please pick up something. He's hilarious. He's from the South. He's acerbic. He's witty. Um, and I don't know anybody who doesn't enjoy him. Um, my husband and I both read David Sedaris and our reading tastes are nothing alike. So give David Sedaris a try. I highly recommend him. What is next? Number seven. This one's a little controversial. This is Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. So I do not like this guy. I did not vote for him. I will never vote for him. Um, <laughs> so now that we've got that out of the way, I do live in Ohio, so voting for him is an option. Um, this is Hillbilly Elegy, a memory of a family and culture in crisis. So why, Shannon? Why would you pick up his book if you dislike him so much? Well, um, his roots are similar to mine. He has an Appalachian background. My family is from Appalachia. Um, I understand that it is a well-written, good story. Um, and I'm interested to see how he could come from roots like mine and have such a very different idea about what is good for the world um, than the one that I have. So the blurbs on this one says, you will not read a more important book about America this year. And that's from The Economist, a fairly conservative uh, piece of magazine work. Uh, let's see, a riveting book by Emily S. Fahani Smith, The Wall Street Journal. Uh, let's see, what else? An American classic, an extraordinary testimony to the brokenness of the white working class, but also its strengths. It's one of the best books I've ever read, the most important book of 2016. You cannot understand what's happening now without first reading J.D. Vance by Rod Dreher, the American conservative. So this is Hillbilly Elegy, uh, J.D. Vance. Let's find out a little bit more about it. This one published June 28th, 2016. Now that's three books that I've mentioned <laughs> from 2016 that I've never read. That doesn't surprise me. 2016 was perhaps the worst year of my life. Um, my dad ended up having a liver transplant unexpectedly, and that was a big upheaval for the whole family. He got better, things went well. Um, he, he recovered very quickly. Um, and then he and my mom were hit by a car that crossed uh, the center line and hit them head on doing 80 miles an hour. Um, so he and my mom were both hurt in that accident. He took a long time to recover. Um, probably both because of his health issues and because of the degree of impact, um, and then started having other health issues that they had to look into um, that they thought were because of the accident and some of the medicine he had been put on and found out that he had something called post-transplant lymphoma. So he ended up being in treatment for cancer, and that all happened in 2016. Um, so I was in that place where you're both taking care of your kids, trying to take care of your parents, um, you know, not knowing what was going to happen, getting surprising, terrible news over and over again. So 2016 was not my year. So the idea that I missed a number of great books in 2016, not at all surprising. But let's talk more about Hillbilly Elegy and less about me. Um, 20, uh, June 28th, 2016 by Harper, 264 pages. It is set in Middletown, Ohio, 
New Haven, Connecticut, and Jackson, Kentucky. And Middletown, Ohio is just up the road from where I grew up. Um, it won a lot of awards, an Audi Award for nonfiction, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for nonfiction, the Kirkus Prize for nonfiction, and a Goodreads Choice Award for memoir and autobiography. So here's the synopsis. Hillbilly Elegy is a passionate and personal analysis of a culture in crisis, that of white working class Americans. The disintegration of this group, a process that has been slowly, slowly occurring now for more than 40 years, has been reported with growing frequency and alarm, but has never before been written about as searingly from the inside. J.D. Vance tells the true story of what a social, regional, and class decline feels like when you were born with it hung around your neck. The Vance family story begins hopefully in post-war America. J.D.'s grandparents were dirt poor and in love and moved north from Kentucky's Appalachia region to Ohio in the hopes of escaping the dreadful poverty around them. They raised a middle-class family and eventually one of their grandchildren would graduate from Yale Law School, a conventional marker of success in achieving generational upward mobility. But as the family saga of Hillbilly Elegy plays out, we learn that J.D.'s grandparents, aunt, uncle, sister, and most of all his mother, struggled profoundly with the demands of their new middle-class life, never fully escaping the legacy of abuse, alcoholism, poverty, and trauma so characteristic of their part of America. With piercing honesty, Vance shows how he himself still carries around the demons of his chaotic family history. A deeply moving memoir with its share of humor and vividly colorful f figures, Hillbilly Elegy is the story of how upward mobility really feels. And it is an urgent and troubling meditation on the loss of the American dream for a large segment of this country. So this is very interesting. You know, I understand where J.D. Vance is coming from. Um, I'm curious to see all that he tells in his book, it sounds to me like this is where Trump supporters come from. Um, so we we will see. It's It behooves me to learn more so that I can understand more. Um, and I, I really do want to understand. So um, I'm going to read this book and I'm going to see what J.D. Vance has to say about his own life. And perhaps I can understand more about why he uh, sees things the way he does. So that is Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. The next one I am so excited about. This is a brand new book that I've been dying to read, have not yet purchased, but I got it at the library sale for $2. All right. It is Our Missing Hearts by Celeste Ng, no, uh, number one New York Times bestselling author of Little Fires Everywhere and also Everything I Never Told You. Uh, let's read a couple of the blurbs back here. Uh, Stellar. Ng is a confident, talented writer and it's a pleasure to inhabit the lives of her characters through her clean, observant prose. And that's from the LA Times. Uh, cleverly crafted, emotionally perceptive, a taut tale of ever-deepening and quickening suspense from O, oh, the Oprah magazine. So, and this was a Reese's Book Club pick. So I've been dying to read this one and I got it for two bucks, yay! All right, so um, also, sorry, the cover, I got a little carried away. Um, the cover is a feather. And breaking off from the feather are tiny little birds. So I'm really interested to see what that has to do with the book. Um, so let's learn more about this one. Celeste Ng, Our Missing Hearts. This one is new, October 4th, 2022. So not even a year old yet by Penguin Press. And it's 335 pages. And it won the Goodreads Choice Award for Fiction for 2022. So here is the synopsis. A novel about a mother's unbreakable love in a world consumed by fear. 12-year-old Bird Gardner lives a quiet existence with his loving but broken father, a former linguist who now shelves books in a university library. Bird knows not to ask too many questions, stand out too much, or stray too far. For a decade, their lives have been governed by laws written to preserve American culture in the wake of years of economic instability and violence. To keep the peace and restore prosperity, the authorities are now allowed to relocate children of dissidents, especially those of Asian origin, and libraries have been forced to remove books seen as unpatriotic, including the work of Bird's mother, Margaret, a Chinese-American poet who left the family when he was nine years old. Bird has grown up disavowing his mother and her poems. 
He doesn't know her work or what happened to her, and he knows he shouldn't wonder. But when he receives a mysterious letter containing only a cryptic drawing, he is pulled into a quest to find her. His journey will take him back to the many folk tales she poured into his head as a child, through the ranks of an underground network of librarians, into the lives of the children who have been taken, and finally to New York City, where a new act of defiance may be the beginning of much needed change. So who doesn't want to read a book with an underground network of librarians? <laughs> Doesn't that sound like the most subversive thing you've ever heard? An underground network of librarians. Yes, I am all in for that. Um, also, he ends up in New York City. Um, it's all about stories that his mother told him. This is generational and an immigrant story. These are all things that desperately appeal to me. Um, and also, it sounds a little bit dystopic. Um, I'm not sure what the setting is, what the world building is going to look like, where we are, um, where laws have been written to preserve American culture in the wake of years of economic instability and violence. Is that real life or is that, <laughs> I'm not sure, it sounds a little too close to home, but also authorities are now allowed to relocate children of dissidents, especially those of Asian origin. That sounds more like a post-World War II something, but we will see. I am going to read this one. It is called Our Missing Hearts by Celeste Ng. I hope you might consider picking it up as well. Number nine on my list has this really cool cover. It's called Miracle Creek by Angie Kim. And it is trees as you're looking up into them. These little orange dots, um, but you can see the stars in the sky and the trees at night. Um, and some of the blurbs go like this. Miracle Creek is a marvel, a taut courtroom thriller that ultimately tells the most human story imaginable a story of good intentions and reckless passions. Compelling, generous, at once empathetic and unsparing, I am wrecked. I am heartened and hopeful, which means in short, that Miracle Creek is pretty much the perfect novel for these chaotic times in which we live. And that's a quote from Laura Lippman. I love, I am wrecked. I would love to be wrecked by a book. That is certainly something that I go all in for. If you can make me ugly cry with your book, um, I will never stop talking about it. So this is Miracle Creek by Angie Kim. Trying to keep my stack of books steady here. That was published April 16th, 2019 by Sarah Crichton Books, and it's 355 pages. It is set in Virginia, and it won the Edgar Award for Best First Novel, Goodreads Choice Award for Mystery and Thriller, and for Debut Novel in 2019. Here's the synopsis. How far will you go to protect your family? Will you keep their secrets? Ignore their lies? In a small town in Virginia, a group of people know each other because they're part of a special treatment center, a hyperbaric chamber that may cure a range of conditions from infertility to autism. But then the chamber explodes. Two people die, and it's clear the explosion wasn't an accident. A showdown unfolds as the story moves across characters who are all maybe keeping secrets and hiding betrayals. Was it the careless mother of a patient? Was it the owners hoping to cash in on a big insurance payment and send their daughter to college? Could it have been a protester trying to prove the treatment isn't safe? So that's all. That is all that they tell us in the synopsis, but that is plenty to get my attention. A hyperbaric chamber that may cure a range of conditions from infertility to autism then blows up and they don't know what caused it, but they know it's not an accident. And they're going to inspect the lives of these different people who touched this hyperbaric chamber to find out who did it and why and how. So yes, I am in for this story. Um, it's called Miracle Creek by Angie Kim. It has an absolutely beautiful cover and a premise that I am excited about. So let's see about number 10. The last two on my list here. This one is called Recursion by Blake Crouch. You may know of Blake Crouch, um, pretty famous author. There is no blurb on this book. It just says a novel by the New York Times bestselling author of Dark Matter. And I have meant to pick up Dark Matter several times and still have not done so. Um, so hopefully Recursion is just as good. And I will start with this one. 
So Blake Crouch Recursion, published June 11th, 2019. It is 336 pages, published by Ballantine Books. And it is set in New York City, New York in 2018 and the Pacific Ocean in 27, 2007. And it got a Goodreads Choice Award for Science Fiction and a Book of the Month, Book of the Year Award, both in 2019. Here's the synopsis. Memory makes reality. That's what New York City cop Barry Sutton is learning as he investigates the devastating phenomenon the media has dubbed false memory syndrome, a mysterious affliction that drives its victims mad with memories of a life they never lived. That's what neuroscientist Helena Smith believes. It's why she's dedicated her life to creating a technology that will let us preserve our most precious memories. If she succeeds, anyone will be able to re-experience a first kiss, the birth of a child, the final moment with a dying parent. As Barry searches for the truth, he comes face to face with an opponent more terrifying than any disease, a force that attacks not just our minds, but the very fabric of the past. And as, it, as its effects begin to unmake the world as we know it, only he and Helena working together will stand a chance at defeating it. But how can they make a stand when reality itself is shifting and crumbling all around them? At once a relentless page turner and an intricate science fiction puzzle box about time, identity, and memory, Recursion is a thriller as only Blake Crouch could imagine it, and his most ambitious, mind-boggling, irresistible work to date. So yes, I am down for this one as well. False memory syndrome. Wouldn't that be terrible? I have a grandmother who has dementia and is just losing her memory, but those memories are not being replaced with false memories. That would be even more confusing and devastating if you believed things had happened in your life that hadn't really happened. I don't know how you would ever come to terms with reality. That just sounds awful. Um, but it sounds like there's also a bit of a political thriller in here too, you know, trying to create technology that will allow people to re-experience their memories. That reminds me a little bit of Jennifer Egan and some of the books we've talked about earlier this year. Um, so I don't know, this sounds like a really driving plot um, and it, it's described as ambitious, mind boggling and irresistible. And that's exactly how it sounds to me. So. I cannot wait to read this one, Recursion by Blake Crouch. I have got so many books on my TBR. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and going to the book sale is so much fun for me. You know, a dollar, two dollars. I spent $16 on 11 books. Um, but now when am I going to read them? I mean, <laughs> I'm drowning in books, but I love it. I absolutely love it. So, you know, maybe my happiness is just being surrounded by books and being able to read whatever I want at any given moment. Let's look at the 11th book, the last one on my list. I know some of you are a big fan of this author. This is The Address by Fiona Davis. I got this in hardback. She is author of The Dollhouse, as well as a number of other books where um, the plot tends to center around a location. I, I met her in person maybe a year ago at the Westerville Library. And she talked about the idea that she picks a time and place and then builds out the story around it. Um, there was one about the Barbizon Hotel. There um, was another about a particular, it might even be this one, about a particular like mansion museum type of place. Um, but this one is called The Address by Fiona Davis. And one of the blurbs says, let this evocative novel sweep you away to another time and place. And that's from Pop Sugar. Let's see who else we have. Rich both in twists and period detail, this tale of big city ambition is impossible to put down. And that's People Magazine. So The Address by Fiona Davis. Let's see what we know about this one. Published August 1st, 2017 by Dutton Books. It's 354 pages and it's set in New York City. So I know that I have one viewer who happens to love Fiona Davis and New York City. So I can only imagine that you need to get your hands on this one. I hope you watch this video and you'll uh, see the call out for this book. I will not name you by name. I will protect your anonymity, but I know you are a Fiona Davis and a New York City fan. All right, the synopsis for the address. 
After a failed apprenticeship, working her way up to the head housekeeper of a posh London hotel is more than Sarah Smythe ever thought she'd make of herself. But when a chance encounter with Theodore Camden, one of the architects of the grand New York apartment house, the Dakota, leads to a job offer, her world is suddenly awash in possibility, no mean feat for a servant in 1884. The opportunity to move to America where a person can rise above one station, the opportunity to be the female manager of the Dakota, which promises to be the greatest apartment house in the world, and the opportunity to see more of Theo, who understands Sarah like no one else and is living in the Dakota with his wife and three young children. So you've got the whole star-crossed lovers, love triangle, you've got New York City, you have an amazing, you know, building in the Dakota and learning the history of that. You've got some London, some New York. Um, so I think this one is going to be good. Um, I have enjoyed everything Fiona Davis has written that I've read. Um, I love the idea that she takes a location and finds the story around it. Um, I think that's an amazing way of writing and she does such a great job with it. So that is The Address by Fiona Davis. And those are the 11 books that I scored at the Worthington Library's book sale on Friday um, that I am super excited about. I think you can tell. Um, so I have all of those in my hand and I am uh, ready to start reading some more faster, faster. So <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed this. Um, last time I did a book sale book haul, you guys seemed to really enjoy it. And I got a lot of comments and attention from you guys. So I hope that that will happen again. If you like this kind of thing, click like and subscribe. Let me know so that I can keep track of the things that my viewers really enjoy. I also have a wish list at the bottom of my description. If you want to gift me with a book, I would love that. Uh, Bookshop.org will send it directly to me and I will read it, give it a review on the channel. And if you want, give you a shout out on the channel. If you don't want me to, you can let me know that as well. So I hope you will stick around. I have lots more single book reviews. I have lots more what's being released uh, videos coming up and uh, lots of book tours and other exciting surprises up my sleeve. So I can't wait to see more of you. I hope you're looking forward to seeing more of me and we will talk all things bookish soon. Take care. Bye.